Welcome to Ideas Sunday. It's March 17th, 2019. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Remember Cleveland's Town Fryer restaurant where pretty much every bite took a trip through hot oil? Now, Chef Susie Porter is cooking up a whole new way of life. It was good, I went back for seconds. No matter what color your thumbs are, chances are you're ready for spring to spring. Typically what's good for the environment is good for our business also. So check out what's blooming at one of the country's largest greenhouses right here in Northeast Ohio. And hidden away in a landmark mansion in Cleveland's eastern suburbs is the first museum in the country dedicated to American-made porcelain. It's almost hard to understand how they were made because they're so intricate. Ideas Sunday is next. Brought to you by Westfield. Offering insurance to protect what's yours, grow your business, and achieve your dreams. Good morning and welcome to Ideas Sunday. I'm Rick Jackson. Thanks for joining us. A lot to get to this morning, including the details of Cleveland's failed Amazon bid and an update on Ohio's medical marijuana program. But we begin this morning right where some of you likely are, in the kitchen. Preparing food in a healthy way is easier said than done, especially when you've spent a lifetime frying, salting, and buttering your meals. Former restaurateur Susie Porter is ready to help with her new initiative, Recipe Remix. She's teaching people in low-income communities how to recreate favorite meals in healthier ways. It's a big change for the residents of the Cedar Estates High Rise, where Porter teaches in the kitchen each week. And it's a big change for her. Porter, who operated the now-closed Town Fryer restaurant, was once known as Cleveland's Queen of the Deep Fryer. Ideastream's Mike McIntyre visited Cedar Estates on Zucchini, Spaghetti, and Turkey Meatball Day. It's only mid-afternoon at the Cedar Extension Senior High Rise on East 30th Street in Cleveland, but it smells like dinner time. 64-year-old Linda Brown and her 75-year-old neighbor, Queen Moss, are busy at the stove tending to a zesty marinara while the meatballs they rolled bake on a sheet pan in the oven. Gathered in the dining room at a counter with a view of the kitchen, a crowd of residents is watching a real-life version of the Food Network. The show playing right now is called Recipe Remix. Who's cooking with me? That's the name of former restaurateur Susie Porter's new venture. The lady once dubbed the Queen of the Deep Fryer because her restaurant, the Town Fryer, was known for frying anything, including Twinkies, is now teaching the residents of this Cleveland Metropolitan Housing Authority high-rise how to make the foods they love in a healthier way. And one of the ladies here said it pretty clearly. She said, I was the first person that came in here that didn't try to tell them what to do or what not to do. I showed them how to do it. And there's a big difference there, that I allow them to eat their food. I'm not taking it away. I'm just showing them how to help you know, make it in a healthier way. Today, that means turkey meatballs, a simple sauce, and zoodles, zucchini and yellow squash cut thin with a spiralizer in place of pasta noodles. Resident Larry Carter, 64, loved the healthier approach. Well, I usually use spaghetti, but she used the uh, zucchini, and that was something different, and I liked it. The meatballs was really good, and the sauce was really good, and I didn't have to, and I, I, I'm staying away from salt, so any other situation before I started the class, I ought to put some salt on there, but it didn't need no salt, and, and it, was, it was good. I went back for seconds. <laughs> That's not an uncommon reaction in the months that Porter has been teaching residents at Cedar Extension how to make their favorite foods like mac and cheese, peach cobbler, and spaghetti and meatballs in a flavorful but more healthy way. And healthy is extremely important. All of the seniors in the group, they call themselves the Pioneers of Healthy Eating Club, describe personal health conditions that can improve with healthy eating. Chief among them, hypertension or high blood pressure and diabetes. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Statistics and many studies, the prevalence of diabetes and hypertension is much higher in older African Americans than the rest of the U.S. population. About three, four years ago, uh, I had a foot infection. And when I got in the ambulance, the ambulance driver asked me, did I know I was a diabetic? I didn't even know. Didn't know it. Didn't even know. So when I got to the hospital, they had to uh, 
they cut off my big toe and half of my foot. And then after they uh, did that, they went from one stage to the other. And I'm, I'm here now, and, and they gave me a nice prosthesis because the first prosthesis was the one with the pole. Now the one I got now is, is, is lean. Eating healthy will help him to avoid complications and to stay alive. I wasn't eating healthy. I was eating what I want to eat, how I want to eat it, and I found out that wasn't good because one time my sugar blood was so high, they had, took me, they had to take me back to the hospital and give me a, a, a shot plus, plus a, a drip, you know. But uh, I'm doing a whole lot better now because I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do because I'm planning on being here a little longer. Dolores Gray, 63, president of the High Rises Local Advisory Council, was drawn to Recipe Remix for a different health condition. So with me, I have high blood pressure. And when my blood pressure going up and down, I've been taking my blood pressure pill for years. So I want to stabilize myself to eat differently, but healthily to get rid of my pills. So it's a benefit for me this way to have this class, but also when I do my outreach in the community for seniors, I can tell them about cooking classes and what they can get out of it would benefit because when you eat healthy, when you go to your doctor, your blood pressure is down. If you're a diabetic, your count is down. Your glucose is, is low. How did the woman once dubbed the queen of the deep fryer come to be teaching people how to make healthy food? For Porter, it began with a midlife decision to pursue higher education as her restaurant business, most recently housed in the Agora building, was winding down. She took classes at Tri-C and then Cleveland State University and applied for scholarships at prestigious Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. She was accepted into Cornell's Industrial and Labor Relations School at age 54, and aid and awards made attendance possible. She returned to Cleveland after getting her degree. The main reason that I applied to the Industrial and Labor Relations School was because of the social justice program that they have there. It's, to me, it's all about helping the community. And so when I came back, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. And so I just took my time and really kind of sorted things out. And um, I knew I wanted to do something that would help the marginalized community, whether it was employment or, as it turns out, healthy eating. But, you know, it just did some, I did some seeking to really kind of see where it went. It went to a collaboration with the Connect the Unconnected project of nonprofit Digital C. That project aims to bring high-speed Internet access to residents of CMHA. Beyond the in-person demonstrations with clubs like the Pioneers, Porter is developing a website with recipes and instructions for healthy eating. And an unhealthy diet is not a habit that's easy to break. Grease and butter and salt are tough to avoid after decades of doing things the same way. The barrier is uh, they've been eating this way for so long, it's the mindset. I can't get past not having salt. I can't get past not putting grease in my food. I can't get past not frying my chicken. I, it's the mindset you was raised up with. And as much as they want to, they can't give up the salt. They're not going to get up frying that chicken. They're not going to give up the, uh, uh, the, the, the neck bones. They're not going to give up the pork chops. And you don't have to give it up. It's just that you have to eat it in a different way. Porter has big plans for Recipe Remix to make that different way tasty and doable. She wants to make good ingredients more affordable so people will avoid heavily salted processed foods. And she's teaching them healthier ways to cook. Through a related venture she calls Social Sprouts Ohio, she also envisions ready-to-cook meal kits with the right healthy ingredients. Or, one step further, heat and serve prepared meals for people who can't cook or don't have adequate kitchens. And Porter, who is set to become the local president of the Cornell Club, is using her college connections. She befriended many of her professors because she's around their age. They're helping her with such things as food safety, dehydrating healthy foods to preserve them, and even grinding spent brewery grains into a barley flour that's more healthy than all-purpose flour. She has a lot of ideas and just as much passion, and she's serving up her message one meal at a time. It's just been amazing, the things that we've been able to do and how everybody really loves the food that we've, that we've cooked.
After missing its original fall 2018 launch target, Ohio's medical marijuana program is finally gaining momentum. Through its first two months, sales have surpassed more than $1.8 million. IdeaStream's Gabriel Kramer provides the status update on the state's program, including a look at the first Cleveland dispensary. Backers of medical marijuana say they've already waited for two decades. The bill on medical cannabis was proposed by Republican Representative Wes Rutherford. Of well, given the situation, would you rather have the General Assembly take control of this issue or would you rather have outsiders? There should be some automatic expungement. This is the bill that is all about the patient. The Ohio House has overwhelmingly approved a historic bill that would allow regulated medical marijuana in the state. I think that people are excited about this industry. You know, it's, uh, it's a new frontier. Buckeye Relief's expansion has been rapid since opening last summer. And the company's owner, Andrew Rayburn, uses a giddy tone when he speaks of his Buckeye Relief team. I can't, I can't tell you how great it feels, you know, be an owner, walk around and see, you know, uh, 50 or 60 people out there, you know, all smiles doing, you know, trimming and stuff like that. Because the job itself is not exotic, but the, uh, the being involved with, you know, a movement and what's, you know, really a revolutionary thing is very exciting. The marijuana plants were young at our September visit. The cultivation or growing process had just begun. Now the plants are fully bloomed and are ready for harvesting, which means trimming, drying, and packaging. The company's first harvest started in December. The fifth harvest started last week. While the plants doubled in size, so did the staff. Last fall, Buckeye Relief had fewer than 20 full-time employees. Now, it has 20 to 30 hourly workers on any given day and 36 full-time positions. We're kind of a family. One of those full-time positions is a post-cultivation director. That's Brian Prosick. He previously worked in marijuana cultivation in Colorado. Here, he manages the new and ever-growing harvesting team. We ask a lot of them, and they all uh, just do it out of passion. A lot of new faces, um, a lot of training, a lot of the culture growing. It's exciting to, to see what we're doing every day. Buckeye Relief's harvest schedule is in full swing, but Rayburn is still trying to expand. The state approved the company for a processing license, which allows them to create medical marijuana products such as gummies, chocolates, or lotions. Rayburn expects to begin making those products this summer. It is illegal to smoke medical marijuana in Ohio. It can only be inhaled through vapor or consumed in a different form, such as the gummies, chocolates, or lotions. We've got a benefit that we built the building to accommodate uh, extraction and processing. So our rooms are completely uh, built, the infrastructure is all there, and for us it will be almost as simple as ordering the equipment list that we've planned and plugging it in. Rayburn also applied for two dispensary licenses, which would allow him to sell his product directly to consumers. Those applications have not yet been approved. To reach customers, Buckeye Relief provides his product to eight dispensaries in Ohio, soon to be nine when The Botanist opens in Cleveland. There are a lot of great people who have that same uh, focus on, on, on helping people. Dave Neundorfer is the CEO of Greenleaf Apothecaries, the company that operates a chain of dispensaries in Ohio called The Botanist. Two are up and running in Wycliffe and Canton. This is the Cleveland location, which is expected to open in the next few weeks. I've been blown away by just the kind of the visible legitimacy of the kind of the medical needs of our patients. Greenleaf Apothecaries currently employs more than 30 people. They recently got approved for growing and processing licenses. Pair that with two stores coming soon to Akron and Columbus. Nundorfer thinks the company could have about 100 employees by the end of the year. The botanist has a very modern, garden-like design with well-lit display cases. There is no marijuana in this Cleveland store yet. But the cases have tools to help customers, such as grinders, vaporizers, and childproof containers. This one has the Buckeye Relief logo, which is fitting because Nundorfer spoke about how easy it was to work with other companies in the industry. We're all rowing in the same direction, and I think that we all have a rising tide lifts all ships approach uh, to this program, and, and we're all working really hard to make sure that the program has a great reputation. Back at Buckeye Relief, 
a notable local frequents the high-tech halls. I'm glad to see the medicine going out now to the people that need it. East Lake's mayor, Dennis Morley, often visits to admire and show off the facilities to visitors. We've embraced uh, this as, as being a pioneer, one of the pioneer cities of having it. I have a good working relationship with Andy. Anything they need from me, anything that I need from them, I call and, and we get things done. Each strand or style of marijuana gets a name. This uh, strain, by the way, is Coffee Cake 9, I believe. Each name needs approval from the state. And one of the approved names is a special one. They decided to name a strand <laughs> after you. <laughs> they did name a strand called Mayor Morley. We just actually looked at the packaging. Often in the past, there will be street names or buildings named after former politicians in a city, and you get a strand of marijuana. Mm -hmm. I, when I sent it to my kids, they're like, I "Told you." <laughs> I said, "You know, this will be one of your, you know, one of your biggest legacies." I'm like. I'm good with it. Again, I look at it as a medicine. That's what it's all about. It isn't about anything else except for that. Well, it's time. We can put away those snow shovels and dust off the garden tools. This week brings the first day of spring. The seasonal change gives Mother Nature the go-ahead to open her Crayola box of spring colors and swap out the drab remnants of our Northeast Ohio winter. But while we wait for the first hints of yellow, pink, and orange blooms outside, let's take you inside to one of the largest greenhouse operations in the United States for a visual vacation and some spring stimulation. As IdeaStream producers Mary Fecto and Stephanie Jarvis discover, engineering the perfect plant, indoors or out, goes far beyond a seed and soil. The temperature outside sits just above freezing on this mid-March morning. But inside this climate-controlled greenhouse in Oberlin, Ohio, it's the perfect spring day. Critical for fostering rows and rows of orchids. Vibrant purples, bright whites, and vivid pinks cover about 35 football fields worth of space here at Green Circle Growers. When you walk in the greenhouse, it's kind of like sensory overload. You're smelling plants growing. You're seeing all different kinds of colors. You're feeling a warm temperature. And when the coldest day in Northeast Ohio, it's about 70 degrees in, in, in the greenhouse. You're hearing different things going on, roofs opening, water running to water crops, all different things going on. Co-owner Scott Giesbrecht says orchids represent one-third of Green Circle's production. The company grows more than 8 million orchids annually. You're looking at 70 to 80 different varieties, but really about seven different color subcategories. So we grow, for example, 18 different whites. 15 different purples, but they all have little variations in them. That color variation contributes to the orchid's high demand by consumers. It's the most popular potted plant in the United States. The colors are unlimited. There will never be the same orchid. They're all different. Although they look the same, every plant is different. Marcel Boonkamp is one of the head growers at Green Circle's orchid range. The splash of color that fills the space here, thoughtfully designed and scientifically engineered. A process Boone Camp describes as time-consuming, but necessary. The only colors we can create uh, naturally is, is blue and black and red. Uh, but other colors and mixes of colors, uh, unique patterns, it's all possible by breeding, which takes a long time. In total, that process takes between five and eight, eight years. Orchids at Green Circle begin as tissue culture. Growers use plant tissue instead of seeds to create color consistency in larger quantities. The tissue gets placed into a cocoa plug, a sponge-like consistency that wraps around the roots, which allows for easy potting transfers and gives the orchid the best chance to grow. So a plant goes in here, sits in here, and we put those in a tray. And that's where it all begins at Green Circle. As the orchids grow older, they travel through various areas of the facility each with different climate controls and light levels before they can move to a bigger pot size. One critical moment in the process mimics a Hawaiian winter, exposing the plant to a cooling period. The temperature change triggers the orchid to spike, creating a new flower stalk. Sophisticated technology allows workers to track each individual orchid's progress through the two-year grow period at the Oberlin complex. 
Once they move into a, a bigger pot size, then they get a barcode on the pot. We scan the barcode so we know, okay, this plant, is, this variety is this old, and then we keep track on that plant throughout the greenhouse. Greenhouses span more than 100 acres at Green Circle. It's so large, some workers use bikes to get from one area to another. The company began 50 years ago by John Van Wingerden. His four sons, along with son-in-law Scott Giesbrecht, run Green Circle now. The Dutch influence is strong here in terms of how we work, the processes we employ, the production methods, whether it be the structures that we grow in or the automation uh, that we invest in. That automation plays a critical role in plant production. Aside from the millions of orchids produced each year, Green Circle grows bedding and seasonal plants like geraniums, petunias and hydrangeas, succulents and hanging plants. And if you're thinking this automated helper looks familiar, you're not entirely wrong. While they resemble Disney Pixar's WALL-E robot, these helpers actually pick up and space plants. The company says this reduces repetitive strain injuries, as it removes the need for human helpers to continuously bend down. Humans are still key. We always need them. What we try to do is to automate the, the things that machines can do better. Another machine in the plant meticulously picks up petunia cuttings and sticks each one in its spot in a tray, all in a matter of minutes. Along with its investment in high-tech automation, Green Circle places an emphasis on sustainable production practices. Our very structure is a collector of rainwater that goes to seven different retention ponds that we have around the facility. And we try to minimize the amount of city water we use. Primarily, we are self-reliant on the water that we use that gets collected by the greenhouse roofs and then sent through filtration. So what we found in our journey of sustainability is that typically what's good for the environment is good for our business also. Back in the orchid plant, Boone Camp shares some tips for home orchid care, including ice watering. An ice cube melts slowly, so the roots have time to absorb the water. You can drown a plant if there's water sitting in the pot, but if it's too dry, the flowers will wilt and fall off. Uh, an easy way to see that is that a wet plant has green roots and it's basically working as a sponge. It absorbs the water and uses that throughout the week. If they're dry, they're still very white and if they're looking like this, they definitely need water. And when it comes to engineering, that perfect orchid. So we see all of this great technology, but there's still a pretty big role for you and your team. Correct. We can have the best greenhouse, best equipment, everything but still comes down to having those green thumbs. We're checking all rows every day, We're looking at roots, looking at leaf temperature and greenhouse temperature, humidity. All those factors are really important and need to be right every day. Funding for public transportation the realities of treating pancreatic cancer in the wake of television host Alex Trebek's diagnosis and increased violence directed at health care workers. Those are among the stories and topics discussed this past week on The Sound of Ideas. If you're a teacher at Urban Community School, let alone an administrator, um, you see all the need and you know that you have an opportunity to do a lot more than be just a traditional eight to three school. Uh, and, and for us, when you think about our mission and the commitment that we want to have as an anchor on the near west side, and, and I think we've had for a long, we've been for a long time, we just couldn't pass up the opportunity to do more to see the needs that were hitting us in the face every day. I think one of the pieces that has been missing from this conversation around the gas tax is around public transportation. It's kind of been a footnote in the conversation as opposed to a priority. And, and I understand we have an aging infrastructure that needs to be addressed. But one of the solutions to that aging infrastructure is to preserve it by not having so many cars on the road. So if we can get folks using public transportation, um, you know, it could serve the highway purpose of helping to uh, preserve it, help with decongestion, etc. It's consider it like a very narrow pancake that spreads along your back. And unless it's in a part of the pancreas that can ha give you a symptom right away, the most specific would be like jaundice. So if it's right next to the bile duct which goes through the pancreas, you can get jaundice at an early stage. But if it's at the other end of the pancreas, it may present very late with very non-specific symptoms. It's important that people who work in healthcare, not just nurses, understand that violence is not part of the job. It is preventable um, and the burden for prevention is on the employer. 
So employers have to really step up to the plate, as uh, we're hearing is really encouraging, um, but, there, but there must be more, more done. And tomorrow on The Sound of Ideas, we'll talk about a partnership between Tri-C and Cleveland State to create a supportive pathway to a four-year degree. Then we'll meet the finalist for the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage's Stop the Hate Essay Writing Contest. As always, we invite you to join the conversation. Join us at 9 on 90.3 WCPN. You're watching Ideas Sunday. I'm Rick Jackson. Thank you for spending part of your morning with us. Still to come, a look inside the first museum in the country dedicated to American-made porcelain. But first... I don't think it would have mattered who was on the ballot. They've done the research. We're trying to get the truth so the public knows what's happening. In the fall of 2017, Cleveland joined more than 200 other cities in bending over backward to entice Amazon to bring its second headquarters here. The bid failed, the details a secret ever since, until last week. We discussed the bid and what it tells about Cleveland's economic development priorities during our weekly Reporters Roundtable. But first, some background. In response to a court order, the City of Cleveland released its full Amazon HQ2 proposal late last week. WEWS Channel 5 had sued the Jackson administration in the Ohio Court of Claims after repeated requests for the document had been denied. Even though the city had proposed spending billions of tax dollars to woo the retail giant, it sought to keep details of the failed bid secret, claiming it contained proprietary information. So, here's some of what we now know was contained in the offer initially submitted to Amazon in late 2017. More than $3.5 billion in local and state tax incentives, including rebates and abatements. A publicly subsidized electric microgrid in the downtown area. Access to prime real estate alongside the northwest quadrant of Public Square and waterfront property north of Brown Stadium and along the Cuyahoga River. And an additional 10 acres at Cleveland State University that would house a proposed Amazon University designed to provide a talent pipeline to the company. To be fair, many other cities, more than 200 in all, submitted proposals for a development Amazon claimed would bring up to 50,000 high-paying jobs. Many of those bids remain secret. Some that have been made public were more generous than Cleveland's offer. In the end, Cleveland failed to make Amazon's list of 20 finalists, and Amazon eventually decided to split its second headquarters into two parts, one in the Virginia suburbs of Washington, D.C., the other in Queens, New York. Then, just last month, the company pulled out of New York, citing vocal opposition to the incentives that city was offering, as well as concerns about the impact of shoehorning such a large operation. The incentives were staggering when you saw them. Uh, the most staggering was, and this has never been done, the city would have taken the extra income tax generated by this mm -hmm. project and given a check back to Amazon. That, that's just not done. I mean, usually you, it, when you have a tax increment financing deal, you say the increase in property taxes may be absent, the school money is used for improvements around your property. So mm -hmm. if you need roads and infrastructure, this is how we pay for it. Um, we've never seen the blank check. The third thing that leaps out is we kind of understand the secrecy. Think about this. this the mayor had just persuaded Cleveland voters nine months before to increase the income tax in the city. He was running for re-election as, you know, two months after this bid went in. So keeping it secret that that tax that he just raised was going to be given as a blank check to Amazon helps him with his re-election. If that had come out during the campaign, that would have affected the election. There's it no way it yeah. wouldn't when you're writing that big a check, just a blank check. The county's incentives, they were going to calculate, I don't know how, um, the increase in sales taxes as a result of Amazon mm -hmm. being here. And then that would have been given to Amazon, but it was for very specific things that were related to the move. In city, county, and state, the total came to about $3.5 billion, which is a huge amount and more than some other cities put in. Joe, what's all this say about Cleveland's economic development priorities? Well, I think this says about, the, if you look at the whole case of Amazon across the country, um, it, it talks about you know everybody wants to get go after this this holy grail the golden goose or whatever you want whatever term you want to use for it. Um, 
This, one of the reasons that these figures look so large is that the prize is so large. Mm -hmm. You know, you will come up with an incentive package for a firm of a couple of hundred people to move from one community to another. Um, we're talking here in Amazon 40 to 50,000 jobs that would pay six figures or so as an, average, as an average dollar amount. So that drives everything up. Um, I thought what was most interesting was the willingness, uh, I mean, some of the tax stuff was, as, as Chris said, it was, it was, it was unprecedented, particularly the, uh, the TIF. I thought what was interesting was basically saying that the civic and political leadership for the right deal are willing to, to, to go to bat to put somebody on probably the prime piece of, of undeveloped real estate in downtown, which is that quadrant of, of public square uh, where, where the Ameritrust Tower was going to go before Ameritrust was bought. So the, you know, they, cl they cleared that, what, two decades ago now. And then in that area that's sort of the, uh, as they refer to it on the downtown, is the parking crater. Um, there is a huge potential development potential, and the willingness of them to do that, um, I thought, was, was really interesting. I was struck, though, if you look at what we offered in other cities, and there's, again, there's not a lot of cities. Uh, Brookings did a, a piece earlier this month that, and this was before Cleveland, of all the 230 or so cities mm -hmm. that had applied, only 26 have released the full details of their yeah, bid. Very few. Um, it's the lack of imagination. It basically is, let's just throw money and hope you come. And there wasn't a lot about, you know, Amazon at least, if you, you know, in its initial proposal said, we want to talk about transforming communities. Give us real transformative. I'm not sure many people did. And in the end, they went to the two, mo two of the most prosperous places in America anyway, Which was where aren't going to be transformed. Yeah, which was the plan. I, I, but I do want to point out with the incentive. The, we, we had an example of a, a innovative incentive that was going to go with the Nucleus project, where instead of paying increased property taxes for the rest of the time on the value of the property, they were going to make a discounted down payment. When they proposed that, Eric Gordon took that throughout the community, people digested mm -hmm. it, and ultimately they decided against it. That's not what happened here. The, the city unilaterally decided yeah, we'll, we'll take income tax money that we just, we just increased and we'll give it to them with no conditions, with no discussion. Imagine if Amazon had accepted that deal. They would have gone to city council, which would have to approve it, and say, hey, look, this is the deal. They accepted it. If we don't do it, we're going to lose Amazon. There would have been no community discussion, mm -hmm. and, and we would have set a precedent for how we give away tax money. The other thing that was in the bid is the microgrid. Mm -hmm. This is a fascinating idea. It's one of the best ideas that, that they've right. had. Um, we have a completely redundant electric system in this town uh, because of Dennis Kucinich. It's saving CPP. Mm -hmm. The, the plan was to invest some money, make it completely insulated from the rest of the electrical grid. So if there's a hacking of the nation's electrical grid or another blackout like we had 15 years ago, anybody on this strip in Cleveland would have full power and full broadband. Um, that, that's still out there. I, I think the uh, county and the city continue to talk about it. That could be an economic development juggernaut. People would come here for that. There's much more Ohio politics and news to come. Immediately after Ideas Sunday, stay with WVIZ PBS for The State of Ohio with Karen Kassler. This week, Karen sits down with GOP consultant Mike Gonadakis and Kerry McCarthy, the executive director of the Ohio Mayor's Alliance, to discuss Governor Mike DeWine's transportation budget, including whether the House's increase of 10.7 cents per gallon is enough to address the state's infrastructure needs and what the Senate might do next. Some sports fans consider this the most wonderful time of the year. Basketball's March Madness is just hours away. Baseball begins in only 11 days. The PGA is in full swing. Major League Soccer and NASCAR have started their seasons. The NBA and NHL playoffs coming very soon. And not only is the NFL draft right around the corner, but the Cleveland Browns made a blockbuster trade this week that pundits say makes them a real contender. My poor DVR. Given all of that, it's the perfect time for the Ohio History Center in Columbus to unveil its second largest exhibit ever, Ohio Champion of Sports. It's an interactive exhibit that features stories told by athletes, owners, and coaches, and it covers more than 25 sports. Take a look. Ohio Champion of Sports tells the compelling human story of sports in Ohio. We know that we can't tell national sports history without Ohio. 
um, the birth of the NFL was in Canton. Um, the birth of, the ma of Major League Baseball started with the Cincinnati Reds. We have people like Jesse Owens and LeBron James. We know that Ohio's sports history is America's sports history. I felt better than I did going into the first time when I fought for the title in 87. We wanted to target and, and essentially tackle uh, the topic of sports because we know that it has a broad appeal. Often when people think about history museums, there's a barrier there. Um, they may think it's dry, they may think it's boring, or they may not see themselves in this history. But we know that there's such a visceral connection with sports in Ohio, whether you're a player, a coach, or a fan. Everyone can really make a connection with sports. And of course, Ohio is the place to be. What I love about this particular section is that you see what you commonly think about when you think of sports history. You see jerseys. We have one from Johnny Bench, of course, a famous Cincinnati Reds catcher. We have Pete Rose, who was a player manager for the Cincinnati Reds and, of course, got embroiled in scandal. But we also have archival collections. One of my favorite pieces within this display right here is a scorecard from the 1919 World Series. That game, of course, was played between the Cincinnati Reds and the Chicago White Sox. It became a scandal in itself because of gambling. It was known as the Black Sox scandal. So this piece of history right here provides a lot of context on where the Cincinnati Reds came from, how they were involved in that scandal, um, and also their national impact. So we of course see jerseys, we see other sports memorabilia, but the archival collections provide that great context to tell the full story. Oh, the curry back to Iguodala, up for the layup, oh, blocked by James! You know, it is really odd to think about something from LeBron James, something from just a few years ago, being in a history museum. When you explore this exhibit, you'll see a few items that you might not expect from a history museum. You're used to seeing things that are several hundred years old, but we know that LeBron James is a historic figure today. We're gonna be talking about him for decades and decades. Cleveland, this is for you. We also have materials from teams like Ohio Roller Derby. They're still playing today, but we know that they're historic right now. So we made a lot of decisions as we put this exhibit together to tell stories that we knew people would care about, that would be relevant to their lives today, that could reflect on where we've come from in our sports traditions and, and share, sharing these memories together. It's really important for us to make this a highly interactive exhibit. Specifically within this space, you'll see our wall of hoops so people can uh, test their basketball skills. Well, this is one of my favorite collections that we showcase with an Ohio champion of sports. This comes from the Toledo Troopers. They're one of the, I think, untold sports stories in American history. The Toledo Troopers were a professional women's football team. As the name would suggest, they were centered in Toledo, Ohio. They were extremely successful in the 1970s. They had seven consecutive championships. They were so successful that the Pro Football Hall of Fame actually called them the winningest team in pro football history. When people visit this exhibit, we hope they leave with a sense of connection a sense that their history matters and that sports really factors into a lot of the ways, a lot of the memories that we make amongst ourselves. In the fall of 2012, the Conservation Fund, a nonprofit environmental group, purchased Acacia Country Club in Lyndhurst from its members. The cost, $14.75 million. One month later, the fund donated the 151-acre property to Cleveland Metro Parks, attaching deed restrictions that prohibited its future use as a golf course. Essentially, that guaranteed its future as a public green space. Perhaps you've driven past the reservation, bordered by Richmond and Cedar Roads, across the street from both Beechwood Place and Legacy Village. As we first showed you in this story last fall, Ideastream's Joe Froelich and Mary Fecto paid Acacia a visit to see how a carefully manicured playground for the elite is becoming another jewel in the emerald necklace and open for all to enjoy. There used to be no water out here, all mowed lawn, and now you can just kind of look out and see these wet pockets 
and a whole diversity of different plants. Natural Resource Manager Jennifer Greiser says Metro Parks began transforming acacia from a postcard perfect Donald Ross designed country club to a nature preserve with a simple act of suburban rebellion. They stopped cutting the grass. <laughs> exactly. We, we have a good example of that right here where um, very little work has been done and you can see all of the seedlings from these mother trees here okay. that are coming up as a result of just stopping mowing. During Acacia's first year under Metro Park's control, soil specialists played detective, trying to determine the land's natural state before settlers and developers began manipulating it. Golf courses manage water very heavily. They want water on the landscape when they want it, but then they want the water off the landscape pretty quickly too. So you have a whole nother set of pipes or tile drains underneath the landscape. So it, it leads to very unnatural conditions. And our wetland ecologist, when he first came out here, he looked at the soils and he said, historically, this probably would have been forested wetland the soils really told the story that it probably would be very wet. And so that was our first indicator that one of the things we wanted to do was remove those okay. tile drains. As parts of acacia began reverting to wetlands, vegetation, the likes of which neither Donald Ross nor most suburbanites could imagine, reclaimed their niche in the ecosystem. We have burr reed, which is a really nice native plant for wetland areas. It looks a little bit like cattail here, mm -hmm. but it has this kind of rib in the middle. Um, and you can kind of see how that, that spreads out. And then with the purple flower over here, that's pickerel weed. And then we have some wool grass with that kind of woolly brown top there. So this really is an excellent assemblage of native wetland plants. But Metro Parks didn't simply wait to see what nature might yield. Using public and private grants, the west branch of Euclid Creek, which flowed through the old golf course, has been returned to its natural banks, including floodplains. This is Euclid Creek. It's a very small watershed area at this point. It really just originates amongst a bunch of hard surface up by Beechwood Mall okay. and 271, and we were able to connect it to the floodplain. So all of that stormwater runoff that mm -hmm. comes from the mall, we're able to allow that to settle out on the landscape here. And all those pollutants that mm -hmm. might be amongst it, those can settle out as well. Okay. So it reduces downstream flooding, it reduces downstream erosion, and it reduces pollution. So you have water quality improvements as well as that reduction of flooding. The work of Metro Parks and its contractors has been supplemented by members of the public eager to see the project blossom. School kids have helped gather up thousands of golf balls. Community groups have worked alongside park staff to introduce trees and shrubs to fairways that were, for decades, maintained as wide open expanses. We've been managing acacia for just over five years now, and we've installed almost 6,000 trees and shrubs throughout the 155 acres. Um, so we're looking at a couple of sycamore right here, and the, the goal is that this whole area will be forested. How long does it take for a sycamore to become more of, more of a mature tree? Sure, that's a great, great question. Sycamore are one of the faster growing species, okay. but it will take a couple decades to be a really significant mature tree. And the, the fencing now, is that to keep like deer and other animals away from it? or? Uh, yes, okay. so we do have a good number of deer on the property. And um, I see this is a buffet. <laughs> it is a little bit of a buffet. Our contractors talked about how when they were getting ready to install the plant material, they had it staged up at our maintenance center. And so then they'd g go get a load with a cart and come back. And by the time they got back, the deer were already nipping <laughs> trees that hadn't even been planted yet. <laughs> so it is to protect not only the, the browsing of the, the um, branches, mm -hmm. but also the bucks like to rub the, the, okay. main, the main trunk line as well. During a one-day bio blitz this spring, naturalists, other scientists, and volunteers counted more than 350 species of plants, animals, insects, and other critters in the reservation. Since 2013, they've documented more than 175 different birds here, some full-time residents, others use the former fairways and water traps as places to breed or rest during migration. Deer are plentiful, as are many other smaller animals, including minks. But Metro Parks didn't acquire acacia to maintain its formerly closed status. 
only this time a sheltered property rather than a members-only club. The idea has always been to restore a place where people can touch nature and be touched by it. Folks uh, visit this area every day just for their own daily livelihood, their personal health. We have a number of hospitals in the area, nursing homes. I've talked to a gentleman that after he visits his mom at the nursing home, he comes over here. And I think it's just a bit of emotional reprieve for him. But this is an excellent opportunity to see restoration in action. The fact that we have the cart paths right through our restoration activities really gives people that first-hand opportunity to see the landscape change. We went from the mowed grass to now we're, we're getting into a more diverse landscape. One individual, uh, he's a birder and he adds his bird observations to eBird. And so it's an excellent way for him to um, just easily access a park, observe nature, and even document it and contribute to um, our kind of understanding of, of what's happening here. These days at Acacia, you can find families pushing strollers and walking dogs on former cart paths, bird watchers staring into trees, bikers, joggers, and walkers enjoying an island of bucolic quiet hard by two of the region's busiest shopping centers. Over the first five years, Metro Parks has counted more than a half a million visitors. It just shows how much people want to get out on the landscape and enjoy this green space and I think those numbers will continue to rise. But really, while Acacia Reservation serves the people that, that visit it, one thing I like to say about taking care of our natural resources is that these green spaces and the waterways that flow through them, they benefit everyone in Northeast Ohio by providing clean air, and clean water. So that's where the park district is a service to all of the region. When Richard Barone of South Euclid began buying porcelain, he had no idea his collection would one day grow large enough to fill a house. When it did, he decided to share his passion by starting the Museum of American Porcelain Art. In 2014, he found the perfect home, a building once known for learning, the former South Euclid branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library and one-time residence of entrepreneur William Telling. Barone purchased the 26-room, 20,000-square-foot English tutor after the library relocated. Today, rows of books, movies, and magazines have been replaced by hundreds of pieces of porcelain art. It is the first museum in this country dedicated to American-made porcelain. Ideastream's Dan Paletta visited. Porcelain is a specialized form of clay, quite different from ceramics. Porcelain itself is a mixture of the mineral kaolin, which is a, a, an opaque white mineral, and another mineral called petunsa, which is a, 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 a volcanic mineral. It's a completely vitrified material, meaning it's non-porous. By itself as a material is impermeable and doesn't need a glaze layer. The production of porcelain dates back nearly 2,000 years to China. With its translucent milky white texture and hardness, it was a prized possession. Porcelain was a material that was used as uh, gifts for the wealthy and ruling classes. Uh, there's evidence of it dating back to uh, 1600 BC, and it first made its way to Europe, to the West, via Marco Polo. It's the first one who described it to Europeans, and it was, uh, it was called porcelana, which is the Italian word for cowrie shell because the surface of porcelain was very shell-like. Barone's collection focuses on works by American porcelain artists. Its popularity soared between 1880 and 1920. At the time, Trenton, New Jersey was the pottery capital of the country, with 50 companies producing everything from bricks and home goods to fine porcelain. The clay is particularly good around Trenton, and the best road went from Boston to Richmond, and you have to take your product uh, from some point and deliver it to another point without breaking it. And so this, this was the route that the uh, uh, porcelain went, and Trenton was right in the center of that. Barone first began acquiring porcelain to make a few bucks. One day, that all changed 
when he saw one of the first pieces he bought and sold sitting in a store window. I bought the piece immediately and then began looking online for other pieces. And that got, that was the real story of me getting back into collecting. And there, there obviously was a point where I said, well, it's not just, I'm not just buying a few pieces that I like. I'm going to make this a major part of my life. And uh, there was that point, uh, uh, I'm going to say it was around 2010, 2011. Uh, ten years ago uh, was the genesis of what this museum is today. The Museum of American Porcelain Art Collection totals nearly 2,000 pieces from American studios like Balik, Braun, Sebus, and Edward Marshall Beam. Often referred to as the father of American porcelain art sculptors, Beam revolutionized the fabrication of elaborate statues, some with as many as 300 pieces. He was very much uh, a naturalist. A great deal of what you see here are the various birds that came out of his aviary. What fascinates me as much was the, uh, was the context in which those birds are displayed. Uh, the blades of grass, the twigs, the, it's so uh, lifelike. These are uh, multi-part objects where individual elements are cast and then glazed and then essentially assembled. And they create these um, almost, uh, they're almost hard to believe, to, really it's almost hard to understand how they were made because they're so intricate. The Beam Studio produced works of art for popes, presidents, and world leaders. In 1972, President Nixon presented Beam's Birds of Peace to Chairman Mao Zedong during his historic trip to communist China. There's that wonderful story about, I think it was the Eisenhowers is the first president um, that got sent a piece of beam porcelain, and then after that, every first lady got a, uh, some sort of flower, I believe it was. It's more about beam and his wife. She was an excellent marketer. She understood, she understood kind of what people were interested in and what they wanted, and if they weren't interested in it and didn't want it, she helped make a market for it. The museum maintains a collection of photos, newspaper articles, and books about Beam and other American porcelain artists that help preserve the history and legacy of American porcelain art. I came along to preserve American porcelain art, and with Beam being probably the most important part of American porcelain art, uh, being able to, uh, to have the identity, import, most importantly, the, uh, the archives, letters that uh, uh, first ladies have written, uh, all of the archives we have, the film strips. Uh, this is a real important part of what this museum's about. It's not just the beautiful pieces. I mean, that's what catches you in the beginning, but it's knowing how important and documenting the importance of not only Beam, but American porcelain art in general. <laughs>Now, before we leave you this morning, jazz and cabaret singer Dane Van Adder is a welcome addition to the Cleveland music scene. A recent arrival from Boston, Van Adder is equally comfortable performing classics from the Great American Songbook, along with songs by Al Green or Coldplay. Van Adder and his trio of pianist Joe Hunter, bass player Brian Thomas, and drummer Ricky Exton stopped by the Idea Center last week as part of applause performances. Let's take a moment to listen in. You have worked a lot in New York City. You've played the Regatta Bar, Scholars in Boston. Mm -hmm. What's the Northeast Ohio scene like for the kind of thing that you do? I think nor I think what's happening in, in Cleveland, at least, and Akron, Northeast Ohio, uh, is great. A lot of the uh, uh, rooms that I used to play in in Boston and New York are no longer uh, open. Um, and it's great that we have clubs here where there's a listening audience. So I love Nighttown. So. Is that a thing that's been going on more, those kind of listening rooms that are conducive to the kind of thing that you do? Are they really starting to close more and more? Well, I see that, I see that happening in Boston and in New York. And uh, even the, the pianos in the hotels, uh, like the Ritz and the uh, Four Seasons, they, they're gone. So it was really, it was a sad way to leave Boston. But I'd love to hear a piece from you. What will you share with sure. us first? Uh, we'll do uh, Duke Ellington's uh, Just Squeeze Me. Mm 
Treat me sweet and gentle When you say good night Just squeeze me Please don't tease me I get sentimental When you say good night Just squeeze me Please don't tease me I've been missing you since you went away Singing the blues away each day Counting the nights and waiting for you I'm in the mood to let you know I never knew I loved you so Please say you love me too When I get that feeling I'm in ecstasy Oh, so squeeze me Please don't tease me It sounds really good. It makes me regret giving up the piano. Well, that's going to do it for us for this morning. Up next is the state of Ohio with Karen Kassler. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Rick Jackson. We'll see you back here Friday night with more great ideas. Brought to you by Westfield, offering insurance to protect what's yours, grow your business, and achieve your dreams.